<clears throat> I am super excited. Who watched yesterday's video? There were 12 views. I know somebody did. Who stopped watching at minute 13? <laughs> After all of my talk about the time I screwed up the audio in my best lecture ever, at minute 13, I turned off the, uh, the stream broadcast of this computer, which is going to those projectors, so that I could focus on this camera, which was going on the blackboard where I was writing everything, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but my microphone was connected to the computer I turned off. <laughs> the mic worked fine the whole time. It just wasn't talking to the video signal. So um, I started to try to do a voiceover of the part where I didn't actually have audio. And that, that was tough. So I have decided that in my office today sometime, I'm going to re-record that part of the lecture as if I was just recording a video. Um, and I'll put a link to that in the thing. That was totally my bad. I could just refer you to the last time I gave that lecture, <clears throat> except that it was the first time I ever gave that lecture. That was like a new topic this term, new way of, of talking about quality. So that sucked. But hey, this little timer doesn't have an alarm, so that was cool. Although the alarm was cool yesterday too. Um, well, but I still don't know how to operate the slides. All right, so yesterday we um, yesterday we talked about quality in high in low volume in high mix manufacturing, right? High mix manufacturing, quality high mix manufacturing. What was the most important thing in that quality and high mix manufacturing that we talked about? Anybody? Go ahead. You get your hand up. Um, so, all right. So, inspection. And so, what does inspection do for us in high mix manufacturing? What is it? I'm, go ahead. Make sure you're doing what you to do. So, am I doing what I planned? Aim, am I doing all right? So our inspection allows us to check if we're making the part the customer asked for. Is that right? And where's the echo? It's the room microphone. Room control. Mic mute. That should be better. It's coming out of the speakers, though, right? It's coming from here. From here. I want to not listen. So I have muted this one. Yeah. No, that's Hello. Hey, fixed it. Okay, and we've got this cool fractal thing going on now. There. Present. All right, so inspection is important because it lets us not ship crap to the customer, right? We don't want to ship anything bad to the customer. We do that inspection. You could do it during the process. So if I make a feature on a part, I could measure that feature on the part and then advance to the next step in the process, make the next feature on the part, measure that feature on the part. So I can make sure I don't make any bad parts all the way through. 
that'll save me some money because if I put a lot of effort into finishing a part that was bad on the first operation, that's bad. But um, basically, inspection keeps us from shipping bad parts to the customer. And we, we started with our RFQ, our quote, right? Purchase order, plan. And we make this plan, we're planning how to make the part, right? So we're saying, all right, so I'm going to put it in a milling machine. I'm going to put these features on our my workpiece in the milling machine. And we'll take it out of the milling machine, put it in a lathe, make some different features on it. So I make a plan for how to make the part. At this time, I also need to plan how I'm going to do the inspection. So when I'm making the plan for how to make the part, I plan for how to do the inspection. Then we program the part. We forgot to write this on our list yesterday. But if we're using, my assumption being that we're using CNC machine tools to make the part. So after we, you could maybe say that the program was rolled into the plan stage, but it's really an extra step. So we program the part, we set up the machine tool, run the part, inspect the part, package the part, ship the part to our customer, and then the part we wanted to do, which was send the invoice, right? When the customer gives us the RFQ, they want to receive the part. When we receive the RFQ, we want to mail the invoice, right? We have to do the other steps to get to the point where we can mail the invoice, but that's what we want to do. So in high volume manufacturing, often those same things happen, right? Certainly the package and ship happens. But what we really want to focus on is this plan, program, setup, run, inspect, and the fact that that can be sometimes kind of a loop. So as you inspect, you may want to adjust um, as you do those things. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Now, yesterday, when we were talking about whether or not we could make something, right? We had, we had an example where there was a diameter and the tolerance on the diameter was roughly the same as the repeatability of our machine tool. And so in that case, it's really hard. Well, it's hard for us to make a good part by just making one part. But if we only have to make a couple parts, it's easy enough for us to make those parts. And, uh, and so that what we were doing is we had a, uh, we had a graph. And so this is the nominal dimension that we wanted. Right, so this is our nominal dimension. What, what, what was it, like 1.25 inches? Something like that. We'll go with that one again. 1.25 plus or minus. Oh, I was two tenths yesterday. I'm trying to decide if that's what I want to use today. Let's just say plus or minus one thou. So 0 0.001. In, and I suppose I should specify inches, right? So if that's what we want to make, if that's the critical dimension, now a single part could have 27 critical dimensions that all need a chart like this. So right now we're just looking at one of these dimensions. In order for that part to work correctly, it may have plenty of many critical dimensions. But if this is the one we want, and, uh, and so our tolerance here say this is uh, you know what let's make this five that way I can do one two three four five and one two three four five so this is wait oh oh five wait five right so plus or minus five so we have a ten thousandths of an inch range that our parts can fall in and as we start making the parts we measure the parts now when we're doing this at the beginning of a production run when we're doing this in the beginning we really want to measure a lot of parts because we don't necessarily know that our process is capable of making these parts right 
if this tolerance was very close to the ability of the machine, then it's going to be very difficult to make the parts. We showed that example yesterday. Now, plus or minus, so if the machine's repeatability is two ten thousandths, plus or minus five thousandths should be pretty easy to hit, right? But the ability of the machine to make that particular feature on that particular part doesn't just depend on the machine's repeatability. Yesterday we mentioned the fact of deflection, right? So if that dimension that we're trying to measure is way out at the end of a long overhang, we could have a lot of uncertainty in where the workpiece is when the tool comes in at the spot where it's supposed to be. So it's really after you do the setup, after you put the stock material in, after you pick the tools, after you start making the parts, that you can determine your capability to make that feature, which is different from the repeatability of the machine. Okay, so we, we do this and we start making parts. And so we get some data points. All right, so we've made a bunch of parts. We've measured them, we've plotted them on a graph. So this axis is time or number of parts, right? It's, it's some way to count when we made the part. So we, have, we, we see how it worked, right? So it went like this. Maybe I did a couple of those in the wrong order. Right, but so, this is why I'm an engineer, not an artist. <laughs> <clears throat> but we've got some variation of our part going across. Now, does this look good to you? So they're never going to be identical. You're never going to have always the same measurement. Does this look okay? So it seems like the average, the mean value, it seems like that's at our nominal. None of our... None of our parts are bigger than the high tolerance. None of our parts are smaller than the low tolerance. So that seems pretty good too. So intuitively, we would say this is probably okay, right? Yeah. And when you're making 10, 15 parts, intuitively, it's probably fine. When you're making 500 parts a day, 1,000 parts a day, and you're going to be doing that indefinitely, Oh, and you just spent a quarter of a million dollars to get an engineering degree. You could use your intuition, but you should probably do some math, right? So what other information could we get out of this besides the graph that we just drew with the same data? Yeah. So precision. And, uh, and when we do our metrology lecture, we're going to talk specifically about the definitions of these terms. So our precision is how close together our measured values are. So how far they are from each other. And that's like if you've ever uh, played darts or gone target shooting with a, with a gun. If you put all of your darts right next to each other on the dartboard, you had a very precise action of throwing darts. If they were not at the target you were aiming for, it was not very accurate, but it was very precise because they're all close together. So that's sort of the definition, the difference between accuracy and precision. Did you mean precision? Yeah. Okay. So we can look at that. That will tell us. So how would we determine precision? We, we've, we've determined the mean value lines up with our nominal value. So that's good. So how would you mathematically define that precision? Standard deviation. And so the standard deviation is it's really a measure of what's the average distance of each point from the mean value. So what you'd do is you'd measure this distance, you measure this distance, you measure this distance, you measure this distance, and then you average all those together. That's the standard deviation. Is that right? Okay, so if we have a small standard deviation, it's more precise. If we have a big standard deviation, it's less precise. <clears throat> As a side note, 
Yes, I believe in global warming. I don't believe it is the biggest part of the problem. It's not just that the mean temperature is going up. The standard deviation of temperature has gone crazy compared to what it used to be. And that's changed way more than the mean has gone up. That's why we have all these big storms like look, last night. Hey, did you know we have an emergency in Worcester right now? Yeah. Flood. Did your, your phone or your watch or something tell you a few minutes ago? Yeah. yeah, me too. I was waiting for the school to then say that my kids didn't have to go to school today. But they did not cancel school even though... The kids might get washed away in a flood when they walk to school. <laughs> I guess there's fewer kids than they save lunch money or something. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So we could do the standard deviation, and that's one of the first things we want to do. What else could we do with this data? So, for, I mean, the first thing you want to do is look at the mean. Does the mean line up with the number you're trying to get? If the mean does not line up with the number you're trying to get, what should you do? Yeah. Take a, look, take a look at your process and see You probably need to make some adjustment to your process, right? So maybe you've programmed the part to be too big. And so your tool is too far away from the part if your mean is high. Um, maybe you didn't set up the tools correctly. And next week in lab, what we're going to focus on is actually setting up the machines. <clears throat> and um, and basically, so when you put the, the end mill in the machine tool, the machine tool doesn't know where the tip of the end mill is. It knows where the end of the spindle is. So how accurately you've measured the distance from the end of the spindle to the tip of the machine tool will impact how accurately the surface on the part gets made. So that's what we're gonna do in lab next week. So you may have to make some adjustment. You may have to make some adjustment to your setup if you find that your mean is off. Um, there's another case. So if instead of just doing a straight mean, if you fit a line to the data, instead of, of, of just calculating a mean, you could have a mean line that goes up like that. So as you're making parts, the average size of the part is getting bigger over time. What does that probably tell you? If you're, if, if, so if instead of going across the mean here, our measurement looked like this. And they were getting bigger as we went across. Yeah. It probably means your tool's wearing out. So as the tool wears out, the program still tells the tip of it to be in the same place. And so the part grows as the tool wears out. It could, it could be some other root causes, but that's the first thing I would look at if I saw that. Yeah. It could be using an old value if the part's incrementally changing too, yeah. Um, if I saw that the line was trending down when I did a graph like this, that means that the part's getting smaller part after part. So it's probably not tool wearing out because tool wearing out usually makes the part, unless you're making a hole. If you're making a hole and the tool wears out, the, part's get, the hole's going to get smaller. But if it's getting smaller like that, I would be looking at something like thermal growth of the machine components. So as anything heats up, it gets bigger typically, except for ice. I think ice gets smaller when it heats up. That's why it floats on water. Uh, but so as the, uh, we, we had a, a part in our shop, the cut time on the part was 24 hours. So you would put the workpiece in the machine, press start, come back a day later, and check to see if you had a good workpiece. Now, we had a lot of checking built in and a lot of automation built in to check the tools and check the part size during the process because over a 24-hour period, the length of the spindle column would change by a thousandth. So the spindle would grow a thou from heat over that 24-hour period. So that could have made our part too small if the tool got closer to the part at the end. Um, the tolerance on the height was five ten thousandths. So a thou growth would be bad. So um, yeah, so you can look at this chart and just see some trends out of it. And again, a lot of that is just using intuition. 
um, when you see that. So what else could we do with a set of data like this? So part dimension over time. We could get the mean. We could fit a line to it to see if it's trending up or trending down. We could get the standard deviation, tell us how precisely we're making those parts. Smaller standard deviation means the machine is better at making that part than a big standard deviation. What else could we do with data like this? Yes. Um, so if it's trending up or down, you could predict when you need to change tools, for example. So if you see that it's going to hit, if you project out further, so extrapolate out further, you can see when it's going to cross that tolerance line, when do you need to change tools. So you could do that. Is there a different way we could present the same data? Yeah. So you could, you could. Um, so one of the things that you'll do in signal analysis, for example, is you'll you may have a, a floating average mean, where you take like the ten most adjacent points and you find the average and standard deviation. So you could plot that. Is that what you meant? Okay. Um, what would the what would the graph look like if you made the graph you're talking about? Yeah, okay. So that's what I wanted to get to. So perfect. So if instead of plotting, let's see. So if instead of plotting our control chart like this, as we go across, we could take the axis here, say this is the mean value so this is the value that we want. So our target value target. And we can see from these numbers, so this one say is, uh, what's the best way? So we could say how many of the numbers that we got are exactly the number we want? How many of them are a little bit bigger? How many of them are a little bit bigger than that? And so we can make a histogram, and it goes both ways, right? And then you could show the outside shape of this, and it sort of will look something like this. If it's normally distributed data, it'll be this nice bell shape, and it'll be centered on the mean value. And um, so we could make a histogram. Now on this, we can also get the standard deviation of our data. However, we, we plot it here, right? We've got our standard deviation. We have our mean value. So we could say here to here is one standard deviation. So one standard deviation this is one standard deviation of the data. This is one standard deviation. We could come out here, say this is two sigma. And we come out here, and this is three. So we could put as labels on our bell curve here, on our histogram, where the standard deviations are. And so, <clears throat> so here's three standard deviations of our data. Yeah, okay, we talked about this stuff yesterday. Yeah, process control, okay. And, and so here's an example of a plot like this from some real data. So here's our Equation for standard deviation. <coughs> and so we can say this is, so our parts are within one, two, or three standard deviations. Now there's some parts out here that are outside three standard deviations. And so what's the distance from negative three to positive three? 
six. And so our symbol for standard deviation is sigma. So one of the things you'll hear often in manufacturing terms is six sigma. So if this is a realistic plot of our ability to make the parts, <coughs> and we're within plus or minus three sigma, so six sigma, we're making, what is it? 3.4 defects per million parts that we make. So we make a million parts, three and a half of them are bad. Do we have, if we know that our process is within this six sigma, do we have to measure every part? No. What happens about those three parts that get through to our customer? Our customer tosses them out. Our customer doesn't care either, right? As long as they don't impact their... So, all right. Anybody rock climb? Would you like to get one of those three carabiners? No. So some parts you have to do 100% inspection anyway. Anybody ever bought something at the store and it was defective? What'd you do? Bring it back to the store, right? You got a new one? Sometimes you're unhappy when you do that. Um, anybody ever done this at, at Walmart? You ever notice that they're happy to take your stuff back at Walmart? No? They used to be always super happy. It was before Amazon took over. But um, if you are a vendor to Walmart and someone bought your stuff, you get paid. Actually, when you're a vendor to Walmart, Walmart doesn't pay you for the stuff until they sell it. In fact, you're leasing space on their shelf to display your stuff to their customers. Walmart pays you after they've sold it. So that's kind of cool for Walmart. That's why they make so much money. Also, if anybody returns anything that was yours for any reason, Walmart doesn't pay you for that. In fact, they charge you extra because they had to handle the return. Walmart makes more money on the part if you return it than they do if you keep it. That's why Walmart is happy to do returns. Amazon is the same thing. Walmart and Amazon are horrible to their vendors. If you're watching, I didn't mean it. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's that's how those large volume sales organizations can handle that. Um, and that's why they're happy to process returns. I bought, uh, I bought one of these from Amazon. It was supposed to be to charge my MacBook. It didn't work. I told Amazon, they said, no problem, we've refunded your card. Please don't send it back to us. <laughs> because they're just gonna have to throw it away if I send it back. And then they've charged the manufacturer back. So um, that's kind of cool. So if you can keep your system in control and you can be in, Six Sigma is the term everybody uses when they talk about this kind of process control. There's nothing magic about six. It's what defect rate are you willing to accept? So if you're willing to accept, if you can't accept six, you could do 12 Sigma. Never heard of anybody doing 12, but certainly seven. Um, and if you're not, and if you're willing to accept more product failures coming out of your shop, then you can go to two or one sigma. So it really depends on that. And that's, that's a business decision. It involves the risk. And what is it that gets damaged when you ship bad parts to your customer? Yeah. Right, the company's goodwill. So it's, are you willing to risk that goodwill against that process? Now, The other thing, and so this is a way to do quality assurance without having to do a significant amount of inspection. Now, do you have to do some inspection as you're going through that? So could you just depend on your process being in control and make the parts? Probably not, because what happens if the tool wears out? 
I mean, it's best if you're doing a cutting operation, the tool will wear out. So you do have to do some inspection, but what you're doing that inspection for is to know when you should change the tools, when you should adjust the process. Um, you've got to inspect your incoming materials. So there's still inspection that happens. Uh, why wouldn't you do this kind of a th thing for the high mix manufacturing? Why do, you, why do I say we do this in high volume manufacturing instead of high mix? So one of the reasons is you may not make enough parts in high uh, of a single part in a high mix environment to actually get enough data to make a curve like this. Uh, so that's one reason you don't do it. That's, I guess, the primary reason you don't do it. Could you say, could you do it for the machine tool instead of for the product? Could you make a graph like this and have, all right, so I have this material, I'm making this diameter. This is how capable I am to make this diameter. I have this material, I'm making this diameter. This is how capable I am. Could you do that? You can, but it doesn't give you as much information as you would like. And that's that's basically what the machine tool makers are doing when they're, when they're telling you this is the repeatability of the machine, right? So the plus or minus two tenths. What they're doing is they're telling you how accurately it re gets back and forth to the same position, but they're not doing it while it's making a part. They're not doing it in your machine shop. They're not doing it with the sun shining on it through a window. They're doing it in an air conditioned laboratory setting where nobody's talking. And so they're trying to find what's the absolute best that my machine possibly could do if Nobody was breathing in the room when I did the experiment, right? So all of those kind of, um, what's the word? Specifications that the machine tool maker or any, it doesn't matter if it's a machine tool, the same, same thing for a ruler, right? So in that case, they're giving you the best that it possibly could be. Okay, so if we're going to set up, when we get back here, so we're at plan and program and setup. So the program and the setup both will impact how well you can make the part. Does that make sense? So I had a, a process where I had a customer who we were making parts that they made normally, but sometimes their production capacity would fall behind. And so they would have an order they needed to fill and they didn't have enough parts on hand to fill the order. And so <clears throat> be very common to get a phone call on a Thursday afternoon that said the part XYZ 27, we need 80 of those Monday morning because they were planning to ship to their customer Monday afternoon. So they need 80 of these parts Monday morning. We made the parts many, many times. So we had material on hand to make them. They knew all this because we were their backup for making those parts. The process that we used to make, it was a grinding process. And um, it was basically makes a round thing, actually it was make a square thing round and then make it the correct diameter, make it the correct thickness and put some champers on it. So really simple part. If I made them and I got one part every 28 minutes, I could run that process all day long, the tool wouldn't wear out. I could also increase the feeds and speeds to make the parts faster. And I could run the process and make a part every eight minutes. So my range of capability was eight minutes per part, 28 minutes per part. It was Thursday afternoon. Need to deliver the parts on Monday morning. You go with the eight minutes per part, right? How many parts an hour at eight minutes per part? Six. How many hours to make 80 parts? Twelve. 
How many working hours between Thursday afternoon and Monday morning? Depends on what time in the afternoon and what time in the morning, but yeah, between eight and 16, something like that. <clears throat> so you run the process faster. When I ran the faster process, $10 worth of grinding wheel went into every part. If you calculate the cost of the grinding wheel when you had to buy it new. So um, I could make them that fast, but it impacted my ability to do that. It also made it much harder. So the, the part variation in diameter was also much higher because the wheel was the grinding wheel wears out so fast. So you can do that, but this plan program and setup, it takes some effort to gather the data to make that chart, but it is worthwhile. Now, what if you're making a new part that you've never made before? So we, we've seen that if we can get our process controlled so that we're within Six Sigma, we probably don't have to do a lot of final inspection. What about at the beginning of setting up the process? We're in this, in this plan program setup part of the process. What are the pieces of information we need to know? So we need to know the specification, right? We need to know how we plan to make the part. So we need to have our plan. And then we need to actually make some parts to make sure we can do it. Does that make sense? Now we may be making prototype parts for the customer. We may be making parts that we're going to try to sell so maybe it was, maybe I have a product, I've invented the product, I'm gonna make the product and sell it to Walmart, right? So, but we have to have specification and a plan. And then what else do we need? Or what do we need to make the plan complete? Yeah. So for, especially if we're costing it, and especially in its, if it's a high mix, and really some of these steps really overlap a lot with the high mix at the very beginning. So we've got to have some understanding, but if we, if our marketing people say that we can sell, we can sell these faster than we can make them. That's a good situation to be in, right? Because then you could always figure out ways to make them faster and make more money. So if we can sell them faster than we can make them. So if we believe that, then what we want to know is, do we have the equipment on hand that can make them? So if I can sell something faster than I can make it, I can pretty much afford to buy any new machine I want. Over time, I'll be able to pay for it, no matter how much it costs. So does our, is the equipment we have on hand capable of making the parts? So we need to know our capability. The way we find out our capability, now we could look at the machine tool specs, right? And we should look at the machine tool specs to sort of get in the range of this machine should be able to make this part. If we actually wanna know, we actually have to make some parts, right? And then we, we get our data and we make our bell curve. Now, All right, so this was our perfect bell curve. The mean is in the center. We've got our six sigma, so this is great. This is what we want, right? What happens if this is the size we need and this is our curve? Can we make the parts? Well, we can, right? If it was a high mix thing, we just make sure we only ship these parts to the customer, right? So we can make the parts. Should we make the parts in high volume? No, right? We need to do something to fix it. Now, what could we fix here? This is just a shift of the mean, right? So we could figure out how to change our setup and our program to shift the mean over to the design range. What else could we do as a pro tip? especially if we are the designer. Yeah. What could, could we fix the range, right? 
could we decide that that's actually okay? Um, there are some times when it might be hard to move this mean. So if you're trying to make a very small part, eventually you run into the smallest part that you can fit in the machine. If you're trying to make a really big part, eventually you run into the largest part that you could fit into the machine. So sometimes it is actually difficult to move that mean with equipment on hand. <clears throat> okay, so we've got that example. Sometimes we don't actually get a normal distribution of our data. So we could have our design range here and we could uh, it's not really maybe this one right so that curve may not be a normal bell curve right so we can in order to find this out we have to make the parts right so we make some parts we measure the parts we plot the data and what we'd really like to know is, is it possible for us to have a controllable process? Oh, you know what? Yes, Q. So this is the ASQ website. We talked about the ASQ in lecture yesterday. They actually have some phenomenal resources where you can learn and I don't believe you need to be a member to look at some of the stuff you need to be a member. Don't buy a membership unless you're gonna be a quality engineer. But uh, they got a lot of really good resources here. Um, you can learn what they say about Six Sigma, but am I on the... I think I clicked a button. Quality resources. I don't know. I want to go back, maybe. There we go. So what we're talking about here is statistical process control. And so they actually have some really cool tools. So when so our keep scrolling. So we had our control chart, right? That's the chart we drew. We had the uh, the parts over time coming out of the machine. That's a control chart. The histogram is where we make the bell curve. So when you find that you have, oh, and a check sheet is just like our inspection report. So these are the things we're going to look at. Um, this cause and effect diagrams. So when you have a problem, they've got some tools that help you step through the process to figure out where the problem might be. And so this, this website is a really great resource. The one I'm going to go to now, though, is also a good resource. And um, I've mentioned I have two little kids in school. My, uh, my older daughter's 13. Last year, when she's in seventh grade, they, they write all these like research papers and stuff. Do you remember doing that? You guys did it much more recently than I did in seventh grade at least, right? Could you cite articles from the internet when you were doing your research papers? Some people said no, some people said yes. So her school lets them cite papers from the internet, but they have instructions, never look at web pages where they're trying to sell you something. And maybe that's appropriate when you're teaching 12 years old, 12 year olds how to use the internet. I mean, it did say never, but don't use that as a reference for your research, right? So I fully admit the um, ASQ guys, they're trying to sell you something. They're trying to sell you a membership in their organization. That does not mean that their data is skewed. Uh, and these guys are trying to sell you some software so that you can do some statistical analysis using Excel macros or something. That does not mean that their data is skewed, but you don't need to buy their software. <laughs> they, have, they have really good resources here that talk about capability of machine tools. And what I wanna look at here is CPK and PPK. 
So when we have our graph there, and um, you guys ever heard that um, engineers don't have to know anything? Who, who knows the punchline of the joke? Anybody ever heard this? Engineers don't have to know anything. They just have to know which book to look in, right? Um, some a reporter once asked Einstein how many feet were in a mile. And his answer was, why would I fill my brain with trivia that I could look up in a reference manual? Right, so that's one of the tricks in being a good engineer is you don't have to memorize the equations. Um, if I haven't told you this yet, and if it wasn't clear from the syllabus, all of the tests and quizzes and exams are open book, open notes. It is only the final exam where I tell you, you can't talk to each other while you're doing it. In all of the other exercises, you're even encouraged to talk to each other while you're doing it. These engineers don't work in a vacuum. In the final exam, I actually, it's worth like 10 points, 10% 10 of the grade. So you would have to screw it up. You'd have to get below a 50 to be really worried about changing your, uh, your grade in the class on the final exam. That's by design. But I do want to be able to separate the people that really got it and the people that didn't get it at all. So that's that. Um, anyway, that's off topic. CPK, PPK are measures of our ability to make the part. And so what we're doing, we have our control chart here with our variation. And we have an upper control limit and a lower control limit. Now, in the first control charts that I drew for you guys, I put the tolerances, right? Well, do you really want to wait till you get to the tolerance before you take action? No. So in reality, what we do is we have an upper control limit and a lower control limit, and the tolerance is out here somewhere. So, so we've done that. And so that's what they're talking about here in USL and LSL. Okay, so what, what they do is they, um, now, and I'll put a link to this here, some good pictures down here. All right, so here, here's a histogram for a process. And <clears throat> the process looks sort of normal, right? It's not perfectly normal, but it looks sort of normal. There's a couple of little peaks here. And so what we're seeing is, oh, and here's our lower control limit. Here's our upper control limit. So we're able to make the parts. <clears throat> and But if it's skewed to one side or if the peak is skewed to one side and there's a long tail on the other side, your process may not be controlled. And so you can calculate these PPQs and CPQs, and they're basically the uh, basically the same thing here. Looked at this this morning. No, nope. is this not the right page? Okay, um, I'll give you guys a link so you can look at these pic uh, pictures and read this stuff offline. What time is it now? Forty-seven. Okay. So I owe you feedback from your last quiz, right? It was essay questions in the week zero quiz. Were there essay questions? I think there was one essay question in the getting started with the lab. So I owe you guys quizzes back graded. If you haven't done that yet, please do it as soon as possible. There's a couple of people that joined the class recently and I don't do the late scoring thing for the, uh, for the first week class there, so the week zero and the um, before your first lab quiz. Everybody managed to get to lab? Is there anybody that's missed lab? Didn't make it to lab at all? You haven't made it to lab yet? Do you have lab scheduled today? Okay, so and you jo you joined the class late? Yeah, okay, you'll be good. And um, I also owe you a new quiz, a week one quiz for you to finish, right? 
Okay, so that'll be posted by the end of the day today. Um, what else? Oh, and I've got to redo the recording for the stuff that we missed yesterday. Um, all right, I'll see you guys on Tuesday, unless I see you in lab later today. Yeah. Don't say that. I'm going to have a weak voice, please.